the stakeholders in education to understand that there is nothing wrong with starting small. In fact, starting small is the actual first step. Hello and welcome to Up Close and Personal at Invoked Studio, where we're diving deep into the heart of leadership and education equity. My name is Ria Mendirata, and I'm very excited to be joined today by Anita Karwalji. Anita Ma'am has been associated with the Indian Administration Services Office for over 36 years. She's been the ex-secretary of the Department of School Education and Literacy at the Ministry of Education. She's also been the ex-chairperson of CBSC and also contributed immensely to NEP and Nipun Bharat. Ma'am, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you, Ria. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start by asking you uh, a question about micro improvements. Um, you've been heavily involved in championing micro improvements, so we want to hear from you. How do micro improvements benefit the system, both the stakeholders and um, CSOs and the government? Okay, so Ria, we need to understand why we need micro improvements, and I'll come to the benefit part. So, uh, you know that we are now in the NEP regime, the national education policy is out, it's been almost three and a half years. When you, when any person looks at the NEP, whether it is a stakeholder, whether it's the most talented teacher, or it's the parent, or an expert on education, mm -hmm. you do tend to get overwhelmed. Because there are so many ideas, so many provisions in it, which have to be implemented to come to that level mm -hmm. that NEP wants us to come to by 2030, mm -hmm. right? Now, if we start getting overwhelmed with such ideas, it will be impossible to implement it. Mm. So what we did when we were in, uh, when I was in the ministry, I was holding the charge of secretary and uh, we were working with Shiksha Lokam at that time and this idea of micro improvements came along mm. and we felt that it is very important for the stakeholders in education to understand that there is nothing wrong with starting small. In fact, starting small is the actual first step nobody starts big right. let me give you a contextualized example so if i want to climb a mountain for example mm. i don't go and climb the mountain on day one i start small i first work on my leg muscles i probably work on my diet you know i work on meditation and pranayam to mm. make my lungs stronger etc etc so it's all small small steps which mm. finally lead to the big step right. so that was the whole idea behind this movement that when teachers stakeholders of the education system if they can start small, they will reach there. Right. So the benefit, as you are saying, the benefit is short term as well as long term. Mm. In the short term, you know, all the small, small initiatives which are coming out, as you would be knowing and you would be seeing on the Vidyamrit portal, right. uh, it's called Vidyamrit. Right. So all these things are impacting the immediate beneficiaries immediately, mm. right? In the long term, this is the first step mm. to actually going big. Right. And this sets in a mindset, a growth mindset, a change mindset, which mm. helps the educational stakeholders to imagine where they want to be. Right. And that is, that is why it's so important. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. What role do you think technology can play here? So you've said that MIPs are important, <coughs> uh, micro improvements. And um, we see that it also builds a hope for the future. When you've accomplished something small, then you're, you're more likely to, you know, uh, carry on for the rest of the path. What role do you think technology has to play in enabling? So I bat for technology all the time. I have no background in technology. And I do not understand the hardware, the software part of it also. But I understand how important it is for governance and for last mile delivery. If you look at micro improvements, uh, just a very small example is that it has a portal where everybody uploads what is that tiny improvement, those five steps you have taken hmm. to reach to that tiny improvement. So teachers are uploading it, principals are uploading it, etc. And then it is getting disseminated all across the hmm. country and other stakeholders can pick on it. But this is not the only way technology actually integrates with education. And hmm. by technology, I take a very, very vast, wide connotation for technology. Hmm. Technology for me does not mean only mobile or internet-based technology or IT as they call it, hmm. um, information technology. For me, technology is everything. We are sitting here in a studio being filmed. Hmm. The camera is technology. Right. The light is technology. Hmm. You know, everything. 
why is this table in front of us round and it has these five, these four legs in a particular position? There is a technology to it. Right. So integrating technology for me means to have a technology mindset, to be able to cr be creative, to be able to create, right. to be able to innovate. Mm -hmm. And that is something which we need to integrate from K to 12, from preschool to 12. And it includes IT, hmm. IT-based technology, because that is something if we don't do it now, our children miss out on it. We are actually going to miss out at the global level, right? Uh, because the future is all about technology. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I can almost visualize the gap that will yeah. it will lead to if we don't catch up with technology right now. Yeah. Um, and, and solving these challenges usually needs massive numbers of people coming together to solve the challenges. You are an expert in building movements. You've, you've been at the helm of uh, Nippon Bharat and you've also championed the micro-improvement movement. Tell us a little bit about, if I may, what is the recipe of a successful movement? I'll give you two examples. One would of course be Nippon Bharat because this is a movement in the making. Hmm. Uh, I would also like to talk about a movement which has already taken roots. Uh, let me talk about Nepun Bharat first. So the idea of Nepun Bharat is that all children who are at the foundational level of learning, which hmm. means preschool to grade two, they should achieve basic skills of numeracy and literacy hmm. along with basic other life skills. Hmm by the time they reach grade three. That is the idea behind right. Nipun Bharat. Now, it's a very simple idea, hmm. but why are we focusing on this? So we have been doing, uh, you know, the system of checking the health of education hmm. in India hmm. is through something called the National Achievement Survey. Right. National Achievement Surveys, though they started in 2001, hmm. but it was for the first time in 2017 when we made it competency-based. Okay. And by competency, I mean the entire basket of skills, knowledge and attitudes that a child requires to lead his or her daily life in the challenging environment that she lives in, right? right. right? So it became competency based in 2017 for the first time. And we found <clears throat> that the results were not very good. Hmm. And we found that uh, close to 45% children in grade 3 hmm. were achieving the competencies, whereas hmm. the rest were not. Right. They were at various levels lower down. Mm -hmm. And as you grow, go to grades from 3 to 10, hmm. those competencies, even of literacy or numeracy, hmm. go down right. rather than becoming better. Right. When we did the same thing in 2021, hmm. from 45% odd, hmm. it came down to 37%. Right. And by the time you go to grade 10, it came down to 10% for literacy skills, for mm. example. Mm. So looking at this, uh, one realized that we have to catch them young. And there is a whole lot of evidence and research to show mm. that children between the age group of 0 to 7, they, their cognitive capacities, they grow at the rate of geometrical progression. Mm. For, so what happens, it's very interesting to know this. So we have these neurons in our brains, right? Mm -hmm. These are brain cells. Mm -hmm. The brain cells, when they attach to each other, it's called a synapse. Right. The synapse will only happen if the child is exposed to stimulation of learning and interactions. Otherwise, there will be no synapse. Mm -hmm. And every child between the age group of 0 to 7 has mm -hmm. the possibility mm -hmm. of 1 million synapses a second. But you have to expose the child Right. to learning, to stimulation, to interaction. Yeah. So there's so much of scientific evidence behind this. So mm. we decided that Nipun Bharat needs to be, you know, taken up mm. on a, in a mission mode. NEP provides for it. Right. So when we came out with it, it required a lot of training across the country because it was, as a concept, it was very new. I mean, mm. we are already focusing on teaching and learning at, in grade right. one and two. And why, why do we need to do it special? Yeah. Then we came out with more research. Right. We did a research on oral reading fluency. Hmm. How many words a minute a child should be able to read in a given language hmm. with comprehension right. to know that the child is literate. Hmm. And for different languages, we found out it's different. It's maybe 55 for Mizo and maybe 60 for Hindi and 54 for English, okay. like that. Hmm. So with all the evidence and research armed with it, with a lot of teacher training, mm. state level training, district level training, mm. we went ahead. I'm glad to tell you it's become a movement. It's been adopted by all the states. Right. 
and all the states are now focusing on the SOPs, the guidelines, the framework has been provided. Right. And it has been provided that when the child reaches grade two and grade three, what are the competencies he should achieve? That is my test. Right. And so when you make it easy, uh, easier goal to understand. Hmm. So the goal is very easy to understand. These are the 10 things that the child should know. Right. Then it is much easier to get there. Okay. And the flexibility is there of doing it your own way. Hmm. You can do it in any which way. Right. So that is Nipun Bharat for right. you, which has become a movement. I want to tell you of a very small example sure. because it's very, very close to my heart. Hmm. So I was chairperson of CBSE hmm. and at that time in 2017, uh, uh, we were looking at, you know, what skills children have and how they are not very employable as they get out of school and they get into colleges. Right. Professional colleges were complaining that, you know, they come unskilled basically hmm. in the skill of communication, skill of problem solving, critical thinking, right. etc. So we realize that pedagogy has been very, very rote learning based and mm. it is chalk and board based. Right. And there has been no innovation in pedagogy, whereas the world has moved towards experiential learning. Mm. So in uh, CBSC, we started this that all CBSC schools, close to 25,000 at that time, mm. they must adopt experiential learning as a pedagogy, at least at the elementary stage between grades one and eight. Okay. For that, you know, we when we started teacher training, nobody would understand what is experiential learning. And they would say, syllabus kaise complete hoga? Hum aise mm. games hi khilate rahenge, to kaise hoga? And right. all that. Then what we did was, we started lecture demonstrations. On the stage, children, a teacher, mm. and an actual classroom going on with experiential learning. Okay. Children going wild over the games and activities and teachers teaching and learning mm. happening, etc. Right. It caught on like fire. And... Many, many schools, I can't say 100% schools because some mm. schools still did not adopt, right. but 80 to 85% schools adopted that process. Mm. Small movement, but it made all the difference to a child's life, yeah. you know, a very learner-centric approach. Absolutely. I think I'm going to summarize, just so I don't forget. Yeah. One, you said highlighting the enormity of the challenge yeah. is essential and that tells you that a movement is needed. Yeah. Making it very explicit what needs to be done. Yes. Um, making it simple to adapt yeah and then making it visible yes or making it visible for and the giving person. the flexibility to you to, right. you have to reach that goal you have it's your flexibility you decide what you want that autonomy that agency is with you right yeah fantastic thank you so much i hope this inspires some of our watchers to start movements of their own for things that they think uh, rapid action is needed uh, i'm going to shift gears a little bit and i'm going to ask you about something that's very dear to us at shiksha loka collective action yeah. Um, now, you've had to work with multiple stakeholders, multiple parties to get things done uh, the way you wanted. And uh, we want to ask you, what is the importance of collective action? Uh, we are right now in the middle of creating collectives at different state levels to try to get different perspectives on the table so that a more holistic design is created for interventions. What is the importance of that? Because it comes with a lot of challenges. Yeah. So just now, back uh, about an hour back, I was asked on the stage that what is the blind spot that my group of people have? And mm. I mentioned that bureaucrats, that one blind spot that bureaucrats have is that I'm always right. Mm. So, and what I'm doing is the correct way and I don't need partners. Mm. So it is a real blind spot. Right. And But what I have seen in my entire career is that unless I take the community with me and I take the experts, the stakeholders with me, mm. I am not able to deliver in the holistic manner in which I had designed to deliver. Right. The, the community, the civil service, uh, civil society organizations, the higher education experts, the industry, whoever you name it, all the stakeholders mm. actually complement you. You can never do in government 100%. Right there will always be a gap which has to be filled by, you know, the collective action. Hmm. So for me, it has always been very, very important that we, we work together. Hmm. And what I have found is that by working together, this I am always right, hmm. uh, whatever I do is the correct way, right. I don't need, it, it opens up a whole world for you and you realize that you were living in a cocoon and you were imposing it hmm. and as a government, you know, I work at scale hmm. and what I do impacts millions and millions of people. Right. And to assume that I'm always right is completely 
I think it's a very poisonous way of working. So collective action is so important mm -hmm. wherever you may be, whether you are on the other side of the government or you're inside the government. Mm -hmm. It is so very important. I want to give you an example. Mm -hmm. So there is a platform called Diksha. Mm -hmm. So in 2017, uh, uh, in Government of India, we started uh, working on this platform with a CSO called Step. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was funded by them. It was designed by them. It was their IT person who uh, did the architecture. Who, mm. It was their platform which hosted it. And this was a platform which was meant for giving educational content from K to 12 and teacher education content. Mm. It was uh, made in such a way that every state could onboard on it mm. and independently curate their own content and the way they would like to present it. Right. But it was interoperable. Right. So if Tamil Nadu puts up something, they can do it their way. But I sitting in Gujarat hmm. can download it and see it. Right. Okay, if right. I have the right keywords and hmm. the right taxonomy. Without them, we couldn't have done it. Hmm. There was a lot of resistance to Diksha hmm. from everywhere, even right. from the states, even within the center, within officers, there hmm. was a lot of resistance. Right. Come 2020 and COVID happens. And what happens? Hmm. Aside from Diksha, there's nothing for the children of this country. And Diksha suddenly becomes so big hmm. because Diksha, we had been working on it for three years with the help of the CSO. Right. And suddenly in 2020, its importance is realized. And all the government schools, because it's free, it's in the public domain. Right. They just latch on to it because this is the only way children can learn. Yeah. There are other organizations, private organizations, which offer you content, but mm. then they offer you at a charge and huge charges. But here right. was something in the public domain. I, we couldn't have done it without this partnership. Mm. Uh, and uh, as I look back, I feel that had we done it without this partnership, right. uh, maybe we wouldn't have been prepared for COVID. Because okay. we, we would have been in our cocoon and not realized this interoperability, this evolvability of this platform right. and how every state has its own autonomy, its own agency. So yes, it's important to work collectively. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, but you know, working in collectives always comes with its challenges of yeah. how do you get everybody to be on the same page, for instance. Tell us how you deal with those challenges so mm. our viewers can also get some inspiration, including me, uh, to continue on that, that difficult path of collective action. Firstly, you have to do a lot of pranayama and meditation at home, <laughs> you know, to stay calm. So um, I am basically a very calm person. So I try and deal with everything hmm. which is within my control uh, in a very calm fashion. Hmm. What is not in my control, I know it is not in my control. Right. I don't dwell upon it too much. But yes, different stakeholders, different ideas, different opinions, different conflicts. I've had so many times conflicts within my organization. For example, when we were drafting the Nipun Bharat policy, hmm. uh, some of our uh, very, very talented faculty members had different views. One hmm. said, Ki nahi, ye aise karna hai. the other hmm. said, ye aise karna hai. Wo bhi jhagde niptane padte the. Hmm. You know, so you have to tell them that, look, you are the theoreticians. Right. We have the grassroots. Right. So, what you have to do in education is that every time you want to resolve a conflict, you have to keep that one point focus. Is this learner centric? That is your one point focus. Hmm. Is my child going to learn? Is hmm. my child, is there addition of, is there value addition to my child? Hmm. Is the child going to get uh, a better learning environment? Hmm. Is it learner centric? Right. And that is what helps you make decisions much more easily as compared to, you know, focusing on 50 different things. Right. And uh, that is what the national education policy also says. It's a learner-centric policy. And right. everything we do is for the learner. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I, I read somewhere that if the vision, if people align on the vision, an alignment to vision uh, has the power to transcend individual work style differences. Yes. Um, so that's what I hear. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm going to now move us to our last uh, segment for today, which is the rapid fire round. Uh, I'm sure you already know this, but I'll just throw some fun questions at you and you won't have time to think. So just say whatever's on your mind. Okay. Are you ready? 
Yes. Okay. But I feel like I'm sitting in a current Johar kind of. Yeah, that that was setup. the goal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, if you were a superhero, what would be your superpower? I think uh, it would be to make every child in this world very happy. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Um, coffee or tea? None. None. Neither. Amazing. Uh, are you a morning person or a night owl? Neither. I'm a day person. So that, that's that's the first time I'm hearing that. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for sharing. What's the most adventurous thing you've ever done? So I've scaled a 12-story building on a rope and then come down. It's called stomach grappling. That's commendable. <laughs> I can't imagine doing that. If you could master any skill instantly, what would it be? I think I would like to learn uh, coding software. Uh, I find it fascinating. Uh, beaches or mountains? Um, no, I don't do either. Again, cities? Uh, no, I like very quiet forests. Okay. Yeah. And maybe I should add that to my options. Yes. Um, my last question is your message to teachers today. I would like to tell them that they are the oxygen of school education. And without them, the system doesn't work. Hmm. Therefore, they need to understand the responsibility that has been put on their shoulders. Without them, no child comes out of the precincts of the school having gathered skills enough to be able to deal with life. Mm -hmm. So teachers, uh, I have a lot of respect for them and a lot of regard for them. I wish them that they have the skill of lifelong learning, continuously keep learning, exposing yourself to new things and bringing it into the classroom. It's fantastic. Thank you so much for that lovely message. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us today. There were a lot of insights that I'm sure our viewers will be very, very grateful for. I'm also very glad to have had this conversation with you. Thank you. Um, that is it for this segment of Up Close and Personal at Invoke Kids Studio. We will see you next time.